and welcome to a very unique Dividend Cafe based on me being out of the country, actually being back by the time you're watching this. Uh, but I kind of want to do something different this week. And I've taken a bunch of questions and topics that have come in, and I'm just going to go through all these one by one. And so at the Written Dividend Cafe, you'll see all of these things sort of uh, drawn out, and we're going to have the questions from people you know, listed out. But let me just walk through it right now. Um, and some of these topics may grab your interest, maybe all of them do. And, and uh, if you have no interest at all in any of the things that I cover, then I guess this really was a disappointment. But I think uh, you might find something uh, here to grab your attention. The, the first issue I want to address is the expectations for the Fed funds rate based on the consumer price index results of last week and the producer price index. And all of a sudden, there being more discussion of, okay, well, maybe the Fed is going to be kind of stuck uh, going a little more aggressive. And you get these two loudmouth governors, um, Bullard in particular out of St. Louis, who is not a voting member of FOMC, but chimes in, oh, we think maybe now a half a point makes more sense. But I just want to point out that the futures market is uh, implying a 79% chance of another quarter point rate hike in March and a 73% chance of another quarter point rate hike in May. And so May is pretty far out and who knows where data is and, and the kind of uh, posture and expectation of the central bank by then. But right now, most things still look, and this is all you know, well past data and even how the bond market kind of tightened um, in response to the PPI and CPI results last week, uh, you know, a very, a close to 80% chance of a quarter point of both meetings. I do not think there'll be a half a point at either meeting. And I do think there's a possibility of no second uh, rate hike uh, in May, but Right now, the futures market is saying differently. So we'll let that kind of play out. I made a reference to Bitcoin and it being so highly levered to speculation, which, of course, uh, is, is a no-brainer right now, that the ebb and flow of Bitcoin for a long time has been that when the Fed is cutting rates and the Nasdaq's going higher. Bitcoin's doing well. And when you're in an anti-shiny object environment or anti-speculation environment, Bitcoin's not doing well. And uh, Steve Eisman, who was famously played by Steve Carell in the movie The Big Short, uh, someone I've met uh, on a number of occasions and, and, and had a chance to speak with. I was formerly invested in one of his Fed hedge funds. They were uh, shorting financial markets and, and, and uh, housing and credit back in uh, 2006, 7, and 8. And so anyways, he I had printed a line from him, a kind of excerpt from a recent talk he gave in last week's Dividend Cafe, referencing... Um, the idea that Bitcoin just simply isn't a reliable medium of exchange. It doesn't have the stability necessary for a store owner to feel comfortable taking Bitcoin as a way of being compensated for what they sell, the goods and services they sell in the marketplace. It strikes me as an entirely self-evident proposition and uh, so forth in the current environment. Somebody pointed out, I think it was a very fair question, you know, isn't that though assuming that the dollar maintains its confidence, that people maintain their confidence in the dollar. And isn't that confidence in the dollar really a confidence in the government that underlies the dollar? And shouldn't we have some sort of openness to the idea of a private currency? And my answer to that is that theoretically, all those things are true. There, there's a number of problems, though. What we're talking about when we refer to confidence in the dollar is a confidence that one will buy something from you and that a, a minute later what they paid you with you could go buy the same thing that that medium of exchange doesn't uh, have a lot of volatility to it a lot of instability and obviously nobody can expect that transacting with bitcoin right now that the volatility is so severe that one literally could accept a hundred uh, units of payment for furniture they're selling on a friday 
and only be able to buy 80 units of furniture uh, by Saturday. I mean, it's almost literally that violent of volatility. And that nobody believes that the dollar represents that, even those concerned about the steady macro inflation that all currencies have simultaneously, even in eroding purchasing power, you're talking about, let's call it two or three or four percent a year, generally speaking, over 20, 30 years, right? The, the question is, do we believe that confidence in the government deteriorates to a point where confidence in the dollar's immediate stability and immediate preservation of uh, what one can turn around and exchange it for alters mo- right away? And my point is the government that does so many things to disagree with, that is so f- fiscally reckless and that has a monetary policy, I think, that can be so questionable that it has the guns. It has a legal monopoly on violence. It has taxing authority in the largest economy and most productive economy in the world. And so do I believe that there's coming a point in which that confidence, with all the bad things one wants to say about government, that the stability of the dollar gets undermined for store owners relative to these other op- opportunities, which, because the question included an anecdote, do you make room for any allowance of private currency? Do I think a private currency competes with the dollar when the private currency doesn't have the taxing authority and, and, monop- and military strength and monopolistic characteristics, um, do I think that, that people find more stability as a medium of exchange in a private currency than that governmentally backed dollar? I do not. And if I did, that same government could quash those private currency ideas in a moment. They could do a Bitcoin in a moment. So no, they can't. It's on the ledger. They can't touch it. But they can. They make it illegal and takes away enough participation to undermine its medium of exchange benefit. They they won't do that. I don't think they should do that, but they could. They are also have a million other regulatory uh, options of what they could do to just diminish uh, enthusiasm for it. So there's all sorts of things that could happen. But fundamentally, what we're talking about is a private currency where uh, it can only kind of exist if the constitutional authority allows it to. The ability to mint money is delegated in the Constitution to the federal government. And I, and, and I understand people can agree, disagree with it. And I myself have so many concerns about our own monetary and fiscal administration. But I've never allowed myself to go to the place where I believe that some of these sort of underground and the one that became very popular in the last 10 years, digital currency alternatives, make sense. And, and that's why, is the medium of exchange is generally not going to be there. Uh, there's not going to be confidence in the medium of exchange unless it is attached to a monopolistic, militaristic power that has taxing authority over the largest economy in the world. Another question. Do we believe that even though demographics point to a lot of cultural problems and and a lot of threat to future productivity, that there could be a technological innovation that overcompensates for declining productivity? And so that even if the demography goes against us, the productivity could go for us and create a better result. And I want to remind people of a basic algebraic formula I use a lot that more or less is a tautology inherently true, that G equals P1 plus P2. Growth equals population growth plus productivity growth. These are two different Ps, P1 and P2, and that those two combined represent our growth in economic output. And do I think in theory that P1 could decline, but P2 could grow more than P1's decline and you and it still offsets. Well, not only do I think that could happen, I think in various occasions it does. But the question is, will we believe do we anticipate the productivity growth from technological innovation being greater than the impact? And I would simply point out, uh, we've been living through an unbelievable technological innovation and expansion of digital growth for 50 years, and it went in light speed 20 years ago, and yet, net-net, 
the various demographic challenges in certain countries. Japan's the example I use all the time. Uh, but even here in the United States, we've had this very subpar productivity and very subpar gross economic output um, at a period of incredible technological advancement. So empirically, it doesn't appear that is the case. Yet, I also think that there is just the broader reality that we're not only dealing with um, the aggregates, but that uh, of productivity potential versus population uh, uh, growth, but that when productivity growth goes higher, the population that is working tends to offset that. And I put a link in Dividend Cafe to a paper that MBER published about this. But this is sort of the study of the 1990s, is that we saw a much greater capacity because of technology and not a big growth in utilization. And, and just to kind of really dumb it down and say something that isn't totally accurate, but just make the point. In other words, because we could get more done with a tool, we used the tool less because we were getting more done and therefore we could we, we could offset that a bit. That's more or less what I think technology's done is not lead to greater net net productivity, but lead to less exertion to get the same productivity. And that people could say is great. You get these four day work weeks and all the things, whatever. I don't think it's great. But even if I did economically, I don't think it is creating the productivity growth necessary to create greater economic growth long term. Um, I got a wonderful question about what I would do, and I clarified with the person, the reader asked the question, um, what I think they will do or what I would do about you know this Japanification. And, and, and the questions seem to indicate more of an interest of what I would do in Japan. And of course, you know, being an American, cap managing capital for American investors, my family and our, you know, um, long-term legacy being uh, uh, Americanized, I have more thoughts around what I wish were the case in, in fiscal and monetary administration and eco economic growth potential and some of the cultural ramifications thereof in, in the context of being an American. Uh, but there's a lot of principles at play that would, would factor into Japan as well. And I'd certainly use the Japanification analogy in a negative context to describe what I think is going on in America. I don't generally like answering the question because I have to be so abundantly clear that what I'm about to say is never going to happen. I don't believe any of the things I'm suggesting are going to be the way things play out. And therefore, that difference between the descriptive and the prescriptive um, is a very important distinction when you actually manage real money for real people. But, but because the, the question was specifically about prescriptive and not descriptive, I will say that as a general formula for what I think Japanified countries that are dealing with stultified economic growth have to do, I do think, I believe in a general framework as to what ought to happen. The problem is, is that none of these things will be popular. And in a democracy and in a political context, if it isn't popular, it very likely won't happen or won't be able to continue happening because those who are unpopular are no longer there to see it through. That's the definition of the political realm or at least in a, in a democratic environment. And yet, there is no play, way this will play out that can be entirely popular. There's no way that the uh, uh, patient is escaping the bender without a hangover. There's no way that the patient is getting off the morphine without pain. There's no way the uh, dieter is, is going to go off the diet and not gain weight. You, I could go on and on with all these cliches and analogies, all of which I think are pretty good. I certainly believe as a prescriptive framework that one of the most obvious things that has to be said is when you're in a ditch, quit digging. And I don't know that there's any solution to beginning to pause Japanification, let alone reverse Japanification that doesn't start with a balanced budget. And there's no way you're getting a balanced budget without across-the-board spending cuts. And there's no way you're getting a balanced budget without entitlement reform. And we're nowhere near entitlement reform and we're nowhere near spending cuts. And so... The balanced budget aspect is just simply not on the table. Um, you also, in my mind, have to have a rules-based monetary policy 
that uh, significantly humbles and and diminishes the responsibility of a central bank in Japan or Europe or the U.S. to be more focused on a lender of last resort than accommodating the spender of last resort. Um, and that's and we've just have decades now of a total redefinition of what we expect from the central bank. And so that framework of reverting to a lender of last resort uh, central bank, a balanced budget. And then on the other end of this, do I think that there needs to be a pro-growth dimension? Absolutely. And that and there's a lot of elements that go in, into that. Um, instant expensing of capital expenditures, full uh, deductibility of capital expenditures is a huge issue. Flatter uh, uh, tax uh, rates on both business and individual income. Um, some type of reform around investment income that, that stimulates capital formation. Uh, the general pursuit of creative destruction as opposed to trying to constantly baby and, and massage creative destruction, leaning into it to get better capital allocation and resource allocation in the society. The, that's the general framework. There's more details and bullet points at Dividend Cafe, but I'll leave it there. Someone had asked if I was on the side of believing that population reduction is deflationary inflationary and points out the very accurate statement that there's a plausible case for both because you're losing both consumers and producers. And in theory, do you end up with less producers, therefore uh, less uh, uh, goods and services, and yet a money supply that might be level or growing? And of course, my ultimate belief in that algebra is that the uh, declining amount of producers and consumers in concert is putting down pressure on velocity, which is disinflationary. However, and of course has been empirically and historically established over the last 25, 30 years in Japan and 15 years in the United States and Europe. But even apart from that, we can't really just evaluate it in terms of population growth. There's something that we call the dependency ratio, but all that is is a way of saying that it's not about your total top line of people it is the composition of the people, folks that are uh, under the age of, of 16 are generally high consumers and low or no producers. People from 20 to 60 are generally very high producers and less focused in, in consumption. And those obviously over a certain age, whether it's 65, 70, what have you, uh, become more, much more consumption focused and less production focused. And so the people uh, dependency ratio is really a way of saying those in your society under 18 and over 65 put together divided by your total population. And a higher dependency ratio is, in my mind, very disinflationary as it does create less tax revenue, more uh, government spending, therefore higher deficits, which I believe puts downward pressure on velocity and is more disinflationary and, in fact, and it's taken to extremes, deflationary. Um, but then that, that issue of less production of goods and services invites other questions. Uh, and what I essentially believe is it creates more wealth disparity because I don't believe you get less production. I think you get more less people doing more production, getting wealthier from doing so. Thank God that they are there to make up the slack for when there is a diminished democratized productivity. But there's a lot of variables about demographics besides age uh, and, and uh, besides top line population. There are is divorce rates. There is age of, of when one marries. There's household formation. There's number of kids in a household. There are mortality rates. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into a global population impact of all these uh, metrics. But I do lean to the side that views the uh, most demographic challenges as being inherently deflationary. Finally, there was another question that came through about in this kind of um, volatile period of stocks, does it make sense to just really capture these uh, nice high yields? You can get four to 5% in a treasury yield for one year or two years. And, and uh, does that make sense uh, in the meantime because of the instability of stocks? I wrote a whole Dividend Cafe in 2022, and the link is in Dividend Cafe this week, about 
um, the opportunities and not opportunities that exist in the present state of the bond market, the health of having a higher yield at the, at the um, risk-free rate. And I also wrote Old Dividend Cafe about why this isn't apples to apples with dividend yields, that the growth of dividends over time from risk assets is an entirely different risk and reward profile than just essentially being able to get a, a 4% return for a year, um, where you don't get growth of the income, you don't get growth of the principal, and you also have a reasonably high chance of reinvesting even that 4% at a much lower yield in the future. Um, I think that those two links, which I've reprovided Dividend Cafe, go deeper in the question. But fundamentally, we just have to remember that uh, those who are premising the question on, um, I'd like to wait till I can find a time where stocks don't go up and down anymore. They will wait forever. I usually say on this side of glory, I'm not even sure stocks won't go up or down in heaven, by the way. But I will, I will leave that theological quandary for another time. I do believe that stocks go up and down all the time. Right now, last year, last decade, last century, next decade, next century. So no, I don't think it makes sense to be hiding out in treasuries while we go through a period of what is actually a permanent condition, that being uh, up and down movement of stocks. I don't believe that uh, this is sustainable, that the one or two year yields will last. And I don't believe it has anything to do with the uh, investment objectives of a long-term investor who needs growth of that income, growth of the underlying asset class. So that's my answer to that question. And there's better links and reinforcement. For those who go to DividendCafe.com, I have a couple other bullet points, not questions from readers, but actually just a few takeaways from some research I had done before recording I want to share with you about China and whatnot. So I'll throw that out. There's kind of a bonus idea if you want to go to DividendCafe.com. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, the, I, uh, next week, I will be back in the California office to, uh, Monday and Tuesday and in the New York office uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I'm really looking forward to to a great full week, and I hope you've enjoyed this kind of unconventional Dividend Cafe. I hope you've enjoyed watching, listening, reading, that you will rate us, subscribe, put us in your player of choice, and help us grow our traffic uh, because it does uh, benefit from being in those subscriber-based lists and all that kind of stuff. Thanks again for all your support at Dividend Cafe. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.